polarizing is one way to describe her personality, life, and work. Influential or controversial, empathetic or exploitative, charismatic or infuriating. Depending on the source, these are words you'll come across when exploring the work of this photographer. In the minds of some, she completely changed the way people look at photography, especially street, giving it the nuance and thought required to elevate it from niche curiosity to legitimate art form. Often considered a photographer of freaks, her life was made up of a multitude of projects, techniques, and emotions that ultimately ended in suicide. This is Street Smarts Volume 15, Deanne Arbus. It's difficult to decide exactly where I stand on the life and work of Deanne Arbus. She was regarded by some as a photographer of freaks, and by others as being a freak herself. As a result of this, there are conflicting ideals over whether or not she chose these subjects to exploit them, or if she had empathy for them and wanted to normalize how they were represented in the eyes of a wider range of human beings. The majority of her subjects were people who were different and stood outside the norms of society, especially at the time these photos were taken. These subjects included cross-dressers, trans people, strippers, carnival performers, people who were heavily tattooed, people with dwarfism, and those with mental disabilities. For some, the main appeal of Dion's work comes from seeing people they wouldn't normally encounter in their day-to-day -day lives. But an additional layer of appeal comes from the fact that when viewing these photos, we have to ask ourselves how we relate to them, how we feel personally about the subjects that are in the photos, and what ethics came into play when the work was created. Finally, we have to consider how our own ethics would be reflected in going about creating work that is in any way similar to this if we chose to take on photographing similar subjects ourselves. According to Philip Leiter, a photography critic and editor-in-chief at Art Forum magazine, with Dion Arbus, one could find oneself interested in photography or not, but one could no longer deny its status as art. It's the thought-provoking nature of Dion Arbus' work that helped take street photography to another level of artistic legitimacy. Prior to Arbus, there are plenty of examples of work that draw you in because of compositions, ability to capture the decisive moment in compelling ways, or the application of new techniques. But it's hard to come by photos that really made you consider the lives of the individuals that inhabited the frames in a way that many of her photos were capable of doing. Popular exposure to these photos first came from an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art called New Documents that showcased her work alongside the work of Gary Winogrand and Lee Freelander, two photographers who went on to become heavily influential in the world of street photography as well. These three were described as a new generation of documentary photographers, whose aim has been not to reform life, but to know it. Getting to know life is where the controversial feelings about this body of work were formed. Part of why some critics feel Arbus was exploiting the people she photographed was because of her upbringing. She was born in the 1920s to a wealthy family that remained wealthy during her adolescent years throughout the Great Depression. This created a separation of lived experiences between Arbus and much of the outside world. Because of the vast number of people who struggled to get by during this period due to financial hardships that became widespread after the stock market collapsed in 1929. Her socioeconomic differences and limited interaction with people outside of her own well-off circles developed an evolving interest within her to understand what life was like for people surviving the Great Depression and its aftermath, as well as people living on the fringes of society. Her interest in photography started when she received her first camera from her childhood sweetheart, who later became her husband. Together, the two would open a studio and work in the commercial photography space for about 10 years. After that decade where she developed the technical skills required to take great photos, she began to seek out more compelling subject matter and had a desire to break away from commercial work entirely. A New York artist by the name of Marvin Israel, known for modern, surreal, and abstract work in painting and photography, and Lizette Modell, a humanist street photographer herself, inspired Arbus to move into making more independent and creative work. Is when she began photographing people who were living on the fringes of society, in ways that were technically well-crafted that resulted in transfixing images. Examples of this include 1961's Jack Dracula at a Bar, another photo from 1961 titled Stripper with Bare Breasts Sitting in Her Dressing Room, 1959's Female Impersonator Holding Long Gloves, and 1957's Fire Eater at a Carnival. These early interests in interesting people continue to expand throughout the creation of many of her other projects. Was Deanne Arbus empathetic or exploitative? Critics throughout her life seemed torn on this issue. Susan Sontag, known for her writing of a piece called Against Interpretation, which argues against overanalyzing art and translating its meaning, claimed that Arbus' work shows people who are pathetic, pitiable, 
as well as horrible repulsive, but it does not arouse compassionate feelings. Guardian writer Sean O'Hagan is compelled to convey that Arbus was at the forefront of a new documentary style, but that her voyeuristic tendencies outweigh the sympathy she may have had for the subjects of her photos because she was knowingly unlike them. He writes, Arbus may have felt an enormous empathy with the people she photographed, but she was not one of them. However much she identified with their outsider status, she had her own troubles, but they were of a different order. The work she left behind remains powerful just because of its dark formal beauty or its stark vision, but it's because it asks questions of the viewer about the limits of looking about the vicariousness and predatory nature of photography and about our complicity in all of this, and that her images hold us in their sway even when our better instincts tell us to look away. Perhaps her greatest gift is that she understood that conflict instinctively and did more than anyone to exploit it artistically. While others, like Sandra S. Phillips, the senior curator of photography at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art stated, to cast Arbus in a role of tragic figure who identified with freaks is to trivialize her accomplishments. She was a great humanist photographer who was at the forefront of what has become recognized as a new kind of photographic art. Was Arbus humanist or anti-humanist? In other words, did she support the rights of individuals to define who they were or how they wanted to be seen? Or did she create work that was intended to draw attention to people who were different knowing that it would have mass appeal to those without any standout identity. Throughout my research, I felt like it was really hard to decide by simply looking at the photos and comes down to the research and understanding of the life and work paired together of any individual consuming her work. Evidence that supports the claim for humanism comes in three key ways. One is that she befriended many of her subjects and photographed them with large gaps in between photos. So these individuals were clearly willing to work with her throughout the course of their lives. Another is that there's an argument to be made that she helped normalize the groups that were labeled as freaks at the time her photos were taken. How much of an impact her photos had on this normalization is obviously up for debate. Finally, she went heavily outside of her comfort zone to interact with these individuals by seeking out connections in the underground social world. There's speculation on why exactly, but it's believed that she did this to deal with her own identity issues since she struggled with the fact that she grew up without adversity and wanted to have a deeper understanding of those who worked through adversity throughout the course of their entire lives. Again, there's obviously debate to be had over whether or not these connections were made for voyeuristic or exploitative reasons, and all the evidence I came across while researching for this essay was from editorials written by critics or from statements Arbus may have editorialized herself to put a positive spin on what she was creating. So it's very much up to the individual to state how they feel about this work and I would love to know how others feel about it in the comments. Because at the time of completing this piece, I can honestly say that I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it myself, and I believe there are valid arguments to be made on both sides. One of her most well-known photos is Identical Twins, from 1966. It was the main influence behind the twins of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. The photo was taken at an event for twins and triplets which Arbus was drawn to because of what photos made there could say about identity. Many of her quotes from this event show how compelled she was by the fact that people could look so similar and dress nearly identically, but if you're really paying attention, you notice all the small differences and details that highlight the unique identity of all individuals. Many different characters fill the frames of Diane Arbus' work. Her final project, which was put on display in the late 20 teens in an exhibition called Diane Arbus Untitled, was of developmentally and intellectually disabled people from the co-educational Woodbridge State School. Scenes from this kind of institution in the 60s are usually bleak, but Arbus chose to focus on the positive encounters she had with people situated there during moments of celebration and fun. Most of the photos I could find from this project come from a Halloween party she attended and show people dressed in Halloween costumes. Other standout work of individuals Deanne put to print were, bear in mind that these are titles given by her of the photos and not my own descriptors. The Jewish Giant at Home with His Parents, Child with Toy Hand Grenade in Central Park, A Young Man in Curlers at Home on West 20th Street, Boy with the Straw Hat Waiting for a Pro-War Parade, Mexican Dwarf in His Hotel Room, and A Naked Man Being a Woman, all encapsulate people being their true selves. The fact that all of these subjects look confident, even though some are in sensitive situations, is a reflection of her empathy and not her exploitation. Most of these photos were included in a project titled A Box of Ten Photographs, which is regarded as the project that pushed Arbus to another artistic level, and is what photography critic Philip Later was referring to when he said, The portfolio changed everything. One could no longer deny photography's status as art.
Most sources claim that Arbus encouraged the subjects of her photos to present themselves as they saw fit. To allow some separation between herself and her subjects, she would look down through ground glass to take her photos, which is believed to have helped promote the confidence stance of people found in her portraits. These factors combined to create what she called the gap between intention and effect, because it could convey the difference between what others and individuals think of themselves. To capture these images, she shot with a twin lens reflex camera, which takes medium format images capable of creating square, sharp, and highly detailed work, which she is known for. Previously, she had shot on 35mm, but became disinterested with all the grain in her frames and began to get terribly hyped on clarity. The aspect ratio of her frames is also important, because she did not crop her images and always printed the entire negative. She was also one of the first to use flash in daylight, which helped create more isolation between her subjects and the background of the frame. To find subjects for her portraits, she never shied away from interesting locations and extensively explored New York City, visiting locations as diverse as public parks, seedy hotels, morgues, and psychiatric hospitals. Throughout her life, Deanne Arbus had many bouts with depression, which resulted in violent mood changes and she reflected on her mental health in relation to creativity in a way many creatives can find some amount of themselves in. I go up and down a lot. Maybe I've always been like that. Partly what happens, though, is that I get filled with energy and joy, and I begin lots of things or think about what I want to do, and get all breathless with excitement. And then quite suddenly, either through tiredness, or a disappointment, or something more mysterious, the energy vanishes, leaving me harassed, swamped, distraught, and frightened by the very things I thought I was so eager for. I'm sure this is quite classic. At age 48, Arbus committed suicide, leaving behind only a note that read, Last Supper. Highly regarded street photographer Joel Meyerwitz is quoted saying, If she was doing the kind of work she was doing, and photography wasn't enough to keep her alive, what hope do we have? Her death has led to other layers of controversy around her art in terms of how it was kept from the world by her estate for decades, and how suicide continues to linger over how her photos are interpreted and observed. Her daughter Dune restricted access to her photography for decades after her mother's death because of concerns over how archives would be interpreted. This worried those who wanted to see her work because they feared that it might never come to light and felt it was significant to the history of photography. However, the archives were finally acquired by the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2007, including hundreds of early photos, negatives, and contact prints from 7,500 rolls of film, annotations by the artist, and her personal photo collections library, books, notebooks, correspondence, and other writings. Much of this material is now put to print and is easy to access. Until next time, keep developing.